All right, cool. We're live. <laughs> Great. Yay. All right, so we're going to start having people join in. And for anyone that is joining in, feel free to type in any questions that you might have along the way. We can get those answered at the end. But for now, let's just, let's go ahead and start. Seven o'clock, so let's start. Um, so hello, everyone. Uh, my name is Nadia Hassan, and I am the founder of Zaya, which is a digital health platform that helps people find high quality, holistic mental health support here in Berlin. And for those of you who are wondering what exactly is Beyond Modern Medicine? What is this event series that's happening? Well, Beyond Modern Medicine is a podcast as well as an online event series that I recently launched after devoting the last five years of my life to really understanding the diverse set of philosophical and alternative practices and approaches in medicine from all around the world. And so after my dad was diagnosed with lung cancer and brain cancer in 2012, and then died from the medication that he was being given three years ago, it really started to, make, started to make me question what exactly is going on in the healthcare system and modern medicine practices in the West. And so I decided to basically take this journey of speaking to different shamans in the Himalayas, the Ayahuasqueros in the Amazon jungle, the Shaivite yogis and the shamans in Indonesia, Tibetan medicine doctors, Western medicine doctors in, in the US. And I really started to understand through this journey, how we can heal ourselves both physically and emotionally in a holistic and also an integral way. And so as I continue this journey, I decided to make an event series and a podcast, especially during Corona times where I wasn't able to travel and it's very diff difficult to get people connected. And I thought, well, this is a great time to do it. So here we are. And today I have two incredible researchers that have been working in psychedelic medicine for almost 10 years or about 10 years, Gabrielle Amiskua and Lisa Wessing. So. Thank you so much for joining me today, guys. And we're here to talk about healing with psychedelic medicine. So first, I kind of just want you guys to both introduce yourselves. Tell us a little bit how you got started working in psychedelics. So my name is Gabriel. I'm, I'm a Mexican anthropologist. Um, I actually started researching psychedelics because I started first researching drugs in a general way. So my path was began with the path of harm reduction and drug policy activism. So I was more into the path of uh, cycling festivals, uh, oh, drug information in festivals. I, I, was giving, uh, I was giving talks in festivals too, and started becoming more and more interested in the ritualistic use of drugs uh, through my anthropology thesis. And yeah, little by little, I started connecting with a lot of the people involved in the psychedelic movement. And I started also researching shamanism and ritual in my anthropology degree. So yeah, little by little, I started connecting with the two worlds, like first with the psychedelic use uh, through shamanism, and then in the psychedelic use through uh, medical Western approach. Uh, I was also connected with with psychedelics in the harm reduction scene. So I would consider that I was connected with psychedelics in the three main spheres, which is recreational use, spiritual use, and uh, therapeutic Western medicine approach. So yeah, right now in a certain way, I'm researching all of these three bubbles, social bubbles of psychedelics and researching the community of, uh, of uh, using psychedelics and researching psychedelics in these three approaches. And yeah, now I'm working with my partner to create an holistic understanding of psychedelics um, without judgment, uh, with a lot of activism included, and always considering the possibility that all of the approaches have something to give to our understanding of psychedelics. Awesome. 
Um, well, I'm Lisa and I'm uh, from Germany. I uh, basically psychedelics kind of brought me to psychology and therapy. I started my bachelor in psychology and was quite alienated from how um, therapy or like the human psyche was actually seen and treated uh, and wanted more. So I changed my, changed my major and integrated anthropology also in, uh, into that, my studies. And after I finished my bachelor, I went to Mexico and there I um, started to work in the harm uh, reduction project that Gabriel had created. And um, I was quite interested always in, in these kind of substances in general, uh, but through working as a sitter, actually having cases and, and helping people through these kind of um, sometimes difficult um, experiences, I really realized that I wanted to be doing therapy and working one-on-one -on -one with people or working in with people in, in these kind of vulnerable yet uh, incredibly, um, yeah, with so, so much potential. So um, then I worked in a clinic in Mexico that um, combines modern um, psychotherapy with traditional ritual using psychedelics. So um, ayahuasca, um, peyote and different psychedelics. And I was able to assist and in that way, learn more about the process um, on a personal level, like a therapeutic level. And I'm currently in training to become a psychotherapist. So the background. <laughs> wow, very cool. So there's a lot of overlap just between the both of you, which really complements mm -hmm. what you're trying to, to offer. Mm -hmm. So I kind of want to go back and start with the foundation of psychedelic medicine and the evolution of it, um, starting with the, the integration, I guess, well, starting with the history of psychedelics and how that's changed into today and how we see it. And Gabrielle, if you can maybe just start explaining how psychedelics have changed and how the different cultures have used it and give us more of a cultural and a spiritual understanding. Yeah, well, I think, first of all, it's important to understand that uh, apparently human beings have been using psychedelics for a long, long time. And we don't really know how long, but we actually have a lot of understanding that most cultures had some sort of psychedelic use, uh, some sort of approach to a psychedelic drug, or some sort of spiritual relation with a gen in, a, in a general way with a drug. Uh, some cultures that didn't have access to psychedelics precisely, they were using drugs, uh, some, some, sometimes such as alcohol, in a certain ways, in a similar way as people used psychedelics. And one of these ways was precisely the communication with the gods and with the spirits. Like uh, most uh, cultures use psychedelics and use drugs in general as a belief system in which they were able to communicate with higher forces. Um, there are several theories, such as the theory by John Allegro about the uh, mushroom cultures or with a stone date theory, uh, which claim that uh, a lot of our evolution as, as humans and as cultures uh, were brought by the psychedelic use. Um, the theory of Allegro uh, portraits that actually like Christianism is built around a mushroom cult. Mm -hmm. And in a certain way, we also have a lot of uh, references towards understanding that psychedelics were definitely playing a very big role on the construction of religions, especially like in, in Mesoamerican cultures, in South American cultures, in Asian cultures, psychedelics were actually very present. Um, but it's also important to understand that not necessarily the way of using psychedelics was always uh, connected towards some sort of psychonautic trip, tripping or self-use. Uh, it means that people didn't necessarily take psychedelics to heal themselves, but actually like it was more the role of the shaman or as they usually prefer to call themselves medics, you know, like traditional medics or traditional doctors, 
they used to take psychedelics and through the communication with the spirits, they healed people. So the process in many of the cultures was that a person came to see a shaman or a doctor and this shaman or doctor, they, they, uh, he took the substance or she took the substance and became in contact with spirits that helped him or her to heal the patient. And it wasn't actually like until kind of more recent history that people started to use psychedelics more to heal themselves. Um, this, this can be tracked more actually like to the use of um, peyote rituals in the Native American culture or sometimes also like the use of uh, Amanita Muscaria in the, shamanist, in the Siberian, Siberian shamanism. Um, but also like we have uh, a lot of references towards seeing that uh, these substances were usually also primordially used by the priests or by the, by the doctor. So it's also interesting to see and realize that the approach of uh, the modern approach to psychedelics has been more about us, the patients taking the psychedelic substance to heal something uh, instead of ha having someone else to take the substance and heal us. And yeah, in, in a certain way, like we have been misunderstanding also that a lot because we tend to believe that cultures always uh, had this ceremony approach of the shaman giving psychedelics to people to, to uh, get into the psychedelic state and heal. Uh, while this is not necessarily true, like there are also a lot of references that Shipibo shamanism or that Native American shamanism in the past apparently used uh, these substances in the same way in which the priest or the shaman took the drug and the other person just was part of a healing ritual. So this evolution is interesting because I think it's connected also like to the inclusion of uh, Western medicine. And I don't know if only Western medicine, maybe also like other medicine systems, but in which people started to take the drugs, the, the substances to heal themselves. More individualism. More individualism, yeah. There, it may be a part of the of this process. Um, and yeah, like it's also interesting to see that most of these cultures were actually connected to the fact that when you take a psychedelic, you will visit some sort of knowledge, some sort of uh, spiritual world in which you will find the answers to the reason why you're taking psych a psychedelic, in this case, like a disease. And it's also important to understand, for example, that in the cultures, in the Amazonian cultures, there was this concept called panema, which was the, the, the way in which people called the diseases. And diseases were not actually what we consider diseases, but were diseases of the spirits. And these diseases of the spirits were only able to be cured by, uh, through the spiritual world. And so psychedelics were a reference to, to travel to this spiritual world and to heal yourself, but not only psychedelics. And that's why psychedelics come usually surrounded by a whole scheme of understanding and knowledge, which are the shamanic tools. And each culture has different shamanic, shamanic tools, such as the drumming, the sweat lodge, the fasting, the meditation, so it's also important to understand that psychedelics are only part of a, of a general traditional system of healing and are not isolated tools, but they are usually in company with many other tools, including also other plants, such as tobacco, such as, uh, you know, even cannabis, uh, uh, and sometimes non-psychoactive non, um, non, non substances. Mm. Very interesting. So... I'd love to hear your thoughts or maybe if you can speak on how uh, colonization really changed the way that psychedelics were accepted in society. And maybe Lisa, you can eventually kind of maybe go into more of the therapeutic history of psychedelics and how, um, how that's basically changed. If you can give us a brief timeline of that. Actually, from my point of view, it's kind of the opposite colonization uh, kind of uh, made psychedelics unavailable for a long period of time. Mm -hmm. And actually from my perspective, decolonization has been the process of bringing psychedelics back, 
back to society. So I'm going to explain myself. When most of the colonization processes occurred, usually like the colonization occurred through uh, Western cultures, which were mostly Catholic or Christian. And they were very actually against drug use and especially psychedelic use. If you usually read any type of, uh, uh, you know, like priest in the colonization processes, any, any kind of like the scriptures of the time, you will realize that they usually interpreted uh, psychedelics as tools of Satan that were uh, given to the people so that Satan could kind of play the, his tricks to people. So it was actually more of an anti-drug system. And it's interesting because I would generally say that the anti-drug campaign started with colonization. And it wasn't until the decolonization process began, which was for me the interest of Western scientists and Western anthropologists into really realizing the the religious systems of, of cultures. And this especially started with uh, peyote and mescaline. Uh, actually, like the first contact with a psychedelic in a general way was uh, mescaline. And it was when the, when the West, Western anthropologists, some of them actually women, they started becoming more into understanding the Native American societies and when they got into them and they started actually started realizing how humane, how spiritual, how harmonical they were, they started becoming actually very interested in their religious rituals. And that's when they discovered peyote. And it was in this process that, that of realizing how peyote was actually used as an harmonical tool for making the community together and that actually it was helping young people to not drink alcohol. It was helping uh, a lot of uh, Native American communities to uh, feel that they still belonged to something, that they started realizing that peyote was actually a very interesting tool. So from my perspective, actually, uh, the discover of psychedelics occurred because of a decolonization process in which the Western societies actually started giving uh, understanding and praising the indigenous knowledges. And that's actually when they started to develop the, the process of understanding uh, psychedelic medicine. And I think this is when Lisa can talk a little bit about uh, what happened then. Yeah, I mean, um, I just wanted to also kind of connect with what you're saying is I, I would say that it's kind of a, a beginning of decolonization uh, and the start of uh, uh, the, the subtler kind of cultural appropriation. Where, um, where people go and say, yes, we actually you know, give importance and, uh, and understand the richness of your knowledge, but we're also gonna take it home and do our own thing with it. Um, I, um, on the therapeutic level, we've seen a kind of a wave-like um, understanding of psychedelics. So when these first botanists, anthropologists uh, discovered mescaline, um, psilocybin, there was um, actually a, a great hype. Uh, at that moment, at first it was, okay, well, what, what is this? What can we do with this? Uh, it was given to many different people, a lot of artists as well, because of the hallucinogenic, uh, hallucinogenic effect and kind of, okay, what can we do with all these visions? Um, and uh, also in the kind of psychoanalytic, psycholytic tradition, uh, it was experimented with. So there was this idea that um, it kind of produces a psychosis. And by basically creating an artificial psychosis, psychologists and therapists were able to study what um, psychopathology is. And uh, that was being done for quite a while um, in more or less uh, rigorous uh, studies. I mean, at that point, uh, scientific study wasn't the same as what we do today. So uh, there wasn't necessarily the same kind of record keeping um, controls or double blind, but it, it definitely created a, a great wealth of information at that point. 
Then during the 60s, um, we sadly had a kind of retrograde uh, step back uh, in which even people who were working with these substances um, kind of caught on the fear mongering. I mean, there's still so much to discover about these substances and we there's always this kind of um, feeling of maybe there's a risk, maybe there's a danger and we don't really know what dangers are, are, are implicit within giving these substances. So um, through illegalization, we had the stopping of mm -hmm of all of basically all research. Uh, we had Rick Doblin in the 80s still trying to kind of allow for a resurgence with MDMA. Uh, but yeah, it was it was stopped. And um, it is interesting that you can still find papers uh, on studies. There were studies, for instance, done in the 90s with LSD, ketamine in a therapeutic set setting. Um, but that was very low key, you know, mm -hmm. universities didn't really want to talk about this, um, even if they were giving the rights to do so. Mm -hmm. um, so it was kind of. Mm -hmm. and, and, and I think it was mostly also because, uh, you know, like when LSD was discovered, um, in only one year, 1000 papers yeah. of research came in only one year after the discovery of LSD. And there were psychologists sending LSD by post mail to a lot of other psychologists and psychiatrists. And they were like, hey, try this. And a lot of them, they were trying it on, on themselves. And the, I think the problem of what happened is that since like the, the creation of Western medicine since uh, the 1900s, since the 1800s, uh, it was based on discovering kind of like an uh, homologation of effects of mm -hmm. substances. Like they were trying to, every substance they tried, they discovered like, okay, this has this effect in everybody. But what happened with psychedelics is that it, it, like some psychologists were like, wow, this is amazing. This is going to change the world. And then another psychologist was like, that, 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 this was shit. This was horrible. And then another psychologist was like, this is actually very dangerous. And so there was no uh, canon. A, a, yeah, canon. There was not a mutual understanding of like, oh, yeah, we can use this for this. So there, were, uh, there was a lot of research and there was a lot of understanding that there was a potential there, but no one really know how to accommodate them. And so when the, when, when the, revol the 60th revolution, cultural revolution happened, I think that a lot of people were actually very scared and they came to the conclusion, especially like psychologists who were kind of mainstream, that they were experimenting with LSD and, and they suddenly saw what happened and a lot of them became, as Lisa said, scared because they actually thought that maybe it had a lot of, pot uh, of uh, abuse potential and that it also had the potential of disruptor of a uh, general cultural pattern. So many people became, many serious people became scared and psychedelics became part of an underground school of thought. And I mean, there was so much uh, delegitimization of the practices. Totally. So uh, with Leary, for instance, giving giving uh, these substances to his uh, to his uh, students and then on him not having credibility in front of the university anymore yeah. for doing these kind of things. So I think there was so many different things that are happening. And now we see a revival. Um, we're seeing a revival in many different ways in terms of um, therapeutic use, in terms of bio neurological understanding of what is happening. We also have new technology, fMRI studies, so we can actually really see what is happening at, while people are ingesting the substance. Um, and the, it, it's booming. And I think we're gonna, we'll probably be talking about this uh, when we're also talking about psychiatric drugs in general, but um, there's been a loss uh, of, of knowing what to do in, in therapy. Uh, he, uh, the rates of uh, depression and anxiety are soaring. Uh, a lot of medication is being given out. Pharma industry is just churning out uh, medication, but they're not really helpful. And people are continuously having to take them for their whole life and, and just basically getting a Band-Aid, but not a solution. So uh, psychedelics right now are, I guess, everybody's so amazed and excited about them because maybe they can be part of a solution and not just a band-aid. 
Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yes, definitely. And so through this revival of psychedelic medicine, now we're starting to see a lot of these different medicines being used in the therapeutic set setting in assisted psychedelic therapy sessions like MDMA and psilocybin. Um, so what is going on? Like, what are your thoughts on the differences between some of these assisted psychedelic therapy sessions that you're seeing in different universities where people are sitting on a couch with their blindfolds on and and sitting with uh, therapists who are guiding them versus recreational use, you know, maybe just going out into the forest or the woods and, and taking psilocybin versus the spiritual use. So being in the Amazon jungle and sitting with a shaman uh, taking these this plant medicine. So what are kind of some of the, the, the benefits of some of them? What are some of the risks? And even just the experiences, maybe even from your own personal use, um, well, I would say that, first of all, each one of the kind of facets of consumption uh, are therapeutic and or can be therapeutic and can be beneficial. Um, it very much depends on the person and the person's needs in terms of what uh, is best suitable. So when we look at what is happening right now with the clinical trials um, and the kind of very safe and controlled uh, therapy setting, um, we are finding great results. Um, they are, they're trying to really control as many variables as possible um, while allowing the person to gain insight from themselves. And this is kind of padded with preparation and then integration this, uh, afterwards which is very helpful, especially in uh, Western context, because the Western context does not have any tradition or ritual around these um, substances. And therefore the clinical or more the medical context is quite helpful to gain trust, to believe in the process, to, to feel comfortable during the process. Uh, recreational use, I would say, goes quite hand in hand in kind of what is called salutogenesis. So salutogenesis is kind of not thinking about disease, but more about health and well-being. So the aim is not about reducing uh, just symptoms within a disease and focusing on the disease, but we're thinking about uh, health and well-being. Um, and this is kind of open to more people. Uh, it's 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 uh, the person who basically we can call them normal in quotation marks and doesn't ha necessarily have uh, diagnosed depression or something, but wants to explore, understand the self, their own self more and gain well-being from that. Uh, that can be the person who might have some issues and through self exploration get better. Uh, this is kind of a more, I would say it definitely is um, great. It, it, it requires more information, more research on the person, on the individual level. So uh, there's no therapist who's there who's going to guide the person through the process. Um, you need to acquire knowledge, have a community, or at least some people that can kind of help you, self-exploration by yourself, I also think is really great, specifically with a kind of a healing intention. But again, you need people around you that can be a safety net if things go kind of haywire. Uh, the ceremonial context, I think, is also incredibly helpful for a lot of people who feel alienated from society and need a kind of a, a back, a connection, again, to something greater than themselves. I mean, right now we've we've in secular societies, especially we kind of, there's a lot of questioning of you know what's the meaning, what's the meaning of all of this, and what's the meaning of life. And through traditional uh, indigenous use, people can gain these kind of this kind of meaning again. Um, and I think it's been it's been quite beautiful seeing people connect uh, on a cross cultural level. Um, however, it's not a you know, it's not a magic bullet either. Going, I don't know, a German person or an American person 
going to the Amazon and then drinking ayahuasca will not mean that it's going to cure you or that it's even going to be a great experience because there's a lot of, um, there's, there's a big kind of gap of knowledge in terms of how we understand what these substances are supposed to do, how the person, the facilitator who administers actually acts, what they do, how they act, interact with the person. And a lot, of the, uh, a lot of times there's a lack of understanding of the symbology, of the meaning behind the ritual context, um, and also mm, different methods. So the idea of integration, integrating the experience after a ceremony, it's more of a Western um, idea. So when then the person goes and is in the middle of the jungle uh, after having done various sessions of ayahuasca, it can be really quite traumatic as well. Yeah. So um, I think all of them, and probably God will, will, will elaborate, in, are incredibly beneficial, but have their downfalls. So whoever wants to do any of these uh, is needs to really understand what they're getting in, in themselves into. Yeah. yeah, in that way, I think it's important to, to come back again to what I said before about that psychedelics don't have... Um, an homogeneous, um, homogeneous effect. Mm. And that's very important to consider because sometimes when you talk about psychedelics with people, um, a lot of psychedelic researchers or, or a lot of psychedelic uh, enthusiasts, they think they have the answer, you know, like they will tell you, no, you know, like psychedelics will let you see your fears or you're going to confront yourself or you're going to see the spirits. And I think it's important to keep that door open. Uh, for example, uh, there is this good friend of ours. He's a, a renowned psychologist in Mexico, 55 years old, something like that. He never took uh, anything before, any sort of uh, substance or anything. And at some point he decided to, yeah, I'm going to do some ayahuasca. I'm interested. And he was, he, he was also very interested in my work. So I was, he was very excited and told me like, hey, I'm going to take ayahuasca. And I was very curious to see what happened. He's not spiritual, a, a spiritual person, but he's a, he's a very good human being. And so he took ayahuasca and he came to me uh, after that. And he was like, you know, Gabo, I'm completely sure that ayahuasca is definitely like a psychotherapy session. It's a, for me, it was a psychotherapeutic session. I, I confronted some uh, traumas. I saw some fears. And, and then I was like, of course, like he's a psychologist. He will uh, transcribe the information of the experience through the psychological knowledge. His filters. Well, his filters. Mm -hmm. So while um, an indigenous person who's in constant contact with nature, he will transcribe the psychedelic experience through this contact with nature. So he will probably see a lot of spirits in the trees. He will feel a lot of connection with nature. If you're a person with a lot of connection with nature, that's also going to be kind of your experience. There are also people who have their biggest revelations in parties, you know, like dancing psychedelic trance and suddenly like seeing the, uh, the tissue of reality be becoming like multiple multiverses. And in a certain way for me, that's very beautiful because what psychedelics also show us is that uh, we are very diverse and that we have very diverse ways of understanding reality. And that's why, from my opinion, we need to enhance all of these processes and we shouldn't close uh, to, to one of them, you know? And that's why many people inside the psychedelic uh, therap therapy world, they are like, no, no, no. But this is the right way of doing psychedelics, as you say, you know, like the blindfold and the psychotherapeutic session. And for me, it's like, man, like that's one of the ways and that's going to work definitely for many people, mm -hmm. but it's not going to work for all of them. Many other people are going to need more of the enhancement of the recreational experience. And that's why we should invest in harm reduction or other people are going to have a beautiful experience in a ceremonial setting. And that's why we sh should also invest in understanding and protecting the, tra the ancestral tra traditions. And it's also about access. I mean, the person, generally you would need a diagnosis to have the Western context therapy um, or the financial means to go to a ceremony. 
um, then recreational uh, use is kind of the one that anyone could have access to, even though it's an illegal right now um, and has its dangers. Uh, but uh, so we have to also think about what it, you know, first of all, not one size fits all. What can I actually access? Do I need a diagnosis? Should we actually say that a person needs a diagnosis to benefit from these substances? Yeah. It's a lot of questions. <laughs> yeah. And I think in that way, it becomes a little bit sad to see that a lot of very serious professionals, they desestimate and discredit uh, other experiences because they don't find them compelling to themselves or because they have never experienced them. Or they're not controlled so, enough. Uh, so, so you have a psychedelic therapist who maybe goes to a rave and take uh, acid and he has a bad experience and he's like, no, 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 this is dangerous. And he's like, well, first of all, like th this is how you lived it. And maybe it was just not uh, for you. Like the, maybe the recreational setting is not for you. But I know many very serious researchers who actually say like that the recreational experience is for them the best one. And that a lot of their patients actually like have the same feeling. So it's the most natural one. Yeah, so, uh -huh, so uh, and you also have a lot of researchers who are like completely convinced that the ceremonial setting is the best one. And I have many examples about that. There is a researcher in California who's giving uh, psilocybin, like therapeutic psilocybin sessions in group therapy. And he is completely convinced that that's the way in which you should do it because he trained a lot of in, in, in Peru and in Colombia with ayahuasca. So he actually came to the realization that the group therapy was amazing because the ceremonial setting, the unity with the participants. And so he was a little bit against uh, the one-to-one one, 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 one sessions. And mm -hmm. there's, there are also people who come out from the psychedelic therapy and they uh, maintain their, their level of happiness and Therapeutic, uh, therapeutic value <laughs> benefit uh, by by actually going to psychedelic parties and they suddenly realize oh this is actually like the way in which I feel the best uh, so I think it's very very important to remain open to remain especially tolerant to diversity because diversity at the end is always and in, especially in these times in which we're talking about Black Lives Matter and about uh, so many things that we need to realize about what diversity means. Well, let's maybe also start with diversity of thought and diversity of experience. <laughs> yeah, um, I would also say that I think that's what we're going to be going towards. A lot more fusion, a lot more acceptance. Um, however, we're still treading within the realms of illegality. Um, and so kind of there's this legitimization process within the scientific world where uh, therapists want to, want to really control everything and make it incredibly safe mm -hmm. so that it seems legitimate to greater society, um, governments to, to allow this process to happen. Um, and that's why they kind of create, you know, are a bit more stark within their process. Yeah. Because um, then you have other people saying, oh, we'll just become like the 1960s and, you know, crazy hippies and people <laughs> jumping out of windows or something. And, and, and that could be counter, uh, you know, counterproductive to the, to the movement. Yeah. Uh, but yeah, definitely yeah. diversity yeah. is always very important. <laughs> yeah, I'd, I'd love to piggyback off of what you guys are talking about. Uh, the next thing I really wanted to, to ask you about is how psychedelics have kind of been progressing through your 10 years of research and seeing how it's really evolved and, and how it's changed, now we're starting to see psychedelics being commercialized. We're seeing psychedelic pharma, pharmaceutical companies starting to, to come up like MindMed and uh, Compass Pathways, for example, and how they're creating synthetic psilocybin. Um, and so I feel like that in itself, like you were saying, it offers this sort of very controlled uh, therapeutic experience. And then if you look at an organization like MAPS, who's focusing on the decriminalization of psychedelics so that there's a little bit more open room for recreational use. Uh, what are your thoughts on this? 
Well, I think it's, um, first of all, I think it's important to go back to what we were saying that every, every way of using psychedelics should be available as long as it's responsible, as long as it's ha it has harm reduction tools, information, all education. Of, uh, education, all of this. So in a certain way, like if these companies want to create their companies, uh, for me, it's kind of fine. But what is not fine, and this is actually like the problem with these companies, is that, you know, like uh, capitalism doesn't enrich itself just by creating products, but also by monopolizing and also by uh, concentrating power and money into the, the, you know, like the means of production. And in this way, the means of production are connected to a system, a medical system. And so this is what we call basically medicalization. So the full on medicalization of psychedelics is extremely dangerous. We know what happens with, when medicalization advances its own agenda towards uh, making patents and uh, creating uh, systems in which people become dependent of, uh, of a specific substance. So for example, uh, many people have been thinking about pre uh, precisely like, okay, how could this work? Because psychedelics are not very easy to make to make them profitable, you know, like you only take them uh, th like around three times in therapeutic sessions. Uh, like these therapeutic sessions are usually like kind of long, but not as long as it was with LSD. Like now with psilocybin, you have a session of two, three, four hours the most, and then uh, that's it. Like you have a substance that is not so expensive in uh, not taking it constantly. So what I find interesting is that these uh, companies, like uh, we have uh, precisely Compass Pathways, MindMed, Field Trip, Entheogenics, Atai Life Sciences, Silo Wellness, like there are all these venture capitalist companies that they portrait themselves as amazingly progressive, but actually many of them are uh, advancing an agenda of, first of all, patenting substances, uh, and advancing the process in which only these patented substances will be the, the ones that are becoming legal, um, but also advancing the possibility of also patenting therapeutic processes. So if you're gonna train yourself as a psychedelic therapist, then you're gonna have to, to basically pay a lot of money to be able to become this therapist. And these are, are gonna be also patented therapeutic systems. So. Basically, what's happening is, is that these companies are just looking the way of making money with it, painting them, themselves as very responsible, you know, because they have a very prepared ad advisory boards. And yeah, like I think what is really wrong with these companies is this, is this way of seeing uh, psychedelic medicine as something that can be monopolized. And they are definitely not saying this. Like if you hear, I, I really would like our listeners to pay attention to the pod podcast of Third, um, what's the name? Like, third Wave? No, 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 Third Wave, no. It's like, uh, I think, well, the podcast of- Plus Sim Three. A plus Three, yeah, exactly, of Symposia. And it's a beautiful podcast that is questioning everything that is related with psychedelic medicine in the more political and kind of like uh, capitalist level like trying to really question what's happening. And yeah, I think our listeners should uh, listen to this podcast because for me, it is, we are in a state of emergency and this state of emergency require us as a society to pay a lot of attention to the movements of these companies and to not let them fool us because, you know, like a lot of people is like, oh, you know, like, have you heard about these companies, how they are, I'm um, doing amazing things for psychedelic medicine. And it's like, wait a minute, like, do not get fooled. Like these companies are protecting their interest. They will say that they are advancing psychedelic medicine for the well-being of human being because they really want to the, like uh, psychotherapy to become something new. And they're selling this image of something very progressive and beautiful, but actually they really want to monopolize practices and yeah, to create like a neoliberal, neoliberal medicalized system around psychedelic medicine. Yeah, as you were saying that a lot of these companies are actually the, the, within the boards 
uh, people are on each other's boards. So we can actually see that they're creating a kind of monopoly. Um, I think it's also, because in the end, as Gabriel started, we will need companies that produce these kind of substances. I mean, we cannot say, okay, we're not going to have any, we're just going to have underground um, labs. And that's not going to be a possibility either. However, it's, uh, I would say that we specifically have to see the political agenda behind it so that we can go hand in hand with decriminalization. Uh, for instance, the, um, the head of uh, Mind Med, Med said that he wants to create, uh, he's going to be creating antibiotics uh, for addiction. So basically he is within the medical track and um, he does not want anything to do with uh, decriminalization because you know, good science has to be given to the patients. And just for him saying patients again says, you have to be diagnosed, you have to be part of the health system to have access. So that's a big issue there. Then also for instance, the, the, these companies are creating some pretty crazy stuff, uh, apparently um, LSD neutralizers, which could potentially be really interesting for, for using LSD in therapy again, because it's so long. And so generally it's not being used because you cannot do a 12 hour session or even longer. Um, but it's also taking away, um, I would say, um, because he also wants to take away uh, the, uh, the hallucinogenic effects and a lot of the effects that what in a, for a lot of therapists is essential. Mm -hmm. So we're not just talking about uh, you take a pill and it's going to change something in your neurology or physiology and then you're better. But we have been finding more and more that it's about, it's an interplay between your biology and your subjective experience. Mm -hmm and what you make out of the subjective experience. The experience in itself is healing. So the meaning you give the experience, uh, the meaning you give to the insight you gave, the way that you harness this kind of experience in your life um, is part of the therapy process. And if we then have companies who suddenly, you know, chop off here and chop off there, then we might be getting a kind of mm -hmm. McDonald's-like yeah. psychedelic experience yeah. that is not actually mm -hmm. valid anymore. It's, it's artificial and, and, and not really giving what it's supposed to be doing. Yeah, yeah and exactly. I, I think, you know, like some of these uh, companies have even publicly said that they are interested in, in taking away the psychedelic effect from psychedelics mm -hmm. and just leave the neurological effects, which would be precisely this uh, neuroconnectivity, neurogenesis. And I think that's actually like a very bad idea. And not only bad, it's ridiculous because this neuroconnectivity and this neurofunctionality and this neurogenesis, maybe actually they arise from the psychedelic experience itself, from the confrontation with whatever happens inside you in the psychedelic experience and uh, um, and you know like when we focus in these companies we're also forgetting about talking about the other companies who are doing the same but in a much more hippie arena and doing the same with ayahuasca and doing the same with San Pedro and doing you know like this kind of like very expensive retreats in Costa Rica in Jamaica and they are actually doing the same they are uh, profiting from the psychedelic experience of these plants, they are uh, definitely um, uh, colon like using colon colonizing techniques in which they are appro culturally appropriating elements of of uh, other cultures to create uh, this uh, a very elite structure and and to create this kind of like psychedelic experience which is aimed towards the same. You know, like we have a miracle cure. You're gonna come, and when you leave this place you're going to be an entirely new person and then people get really confused you know because they come out of these experiences and they are like oh like yeah I feel better but uh, my life still kind of sucks you know and because we are not realizing that uh, the psychedelic experience as the as the as the people from uh, uh, from ancestral cultures know the psychedelic experience come, as I was saying in the, at the beginning, with many other tools. And some of these tools are also about the social process, the natural process, your connection with the natural world, your connection with other people. 
And if you don't have the tools to re, uh, reconsider your entire way of living through the psychedelic experience, then maybe you are just treating psychedelics as, as you are treating a paracetamol, you know, like you're just taking it to feel better, to see if you feel better. And you will probably feel better for a little bit, but that's not going to take your migraine away, you know? <laughs> and it can create such, so many, like, such great expectation. And when that expectation is not satisfied, people may then also think, you know, I'm a hopeless case. Yeah. Nobody can help me anymore. Uh, you know, this magic bullet, bullet that they told me that's going to take it all away, didn't take it away. So, you know, what am I even trying to get better? Exactly. At, you know? I think, yeah. yeah very true and it's going to start creating these expectations and so i guess one thing that we can ask is like how do we actually stop this sort of capitalist agenda from happening so that we can go back to the root of what psychedelics were put on this earth for is to heal and i really love what um the north star ethics pledge does as just you know creating this pledge so that if no one's familiar with it, they have a pledge where it sticks to the commitment of making psychedelics uh, ethical and moral. And so I think that if a lot more of these companies and these organizations were to be taking on this sort of approach as they develop these, um, this sort of therapeutic use, maybe we can hopefully find some sort of balance or e equilibrium in, in this. So it doesn't have to get to the worst of the worst. Um, and if it does, we're just going to have to go back to how our ancestors did it, you yeah. know? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Well, actually, it's interesting because um, I've been researching the North the North Star Pledge uh, for for some months. Uh, I'm a good uh, I'm a good acquaintance of of some of the people of the Orin Project, who are one of the initiatives that uh, supports this pledge, and I really. I really also like their perspective. I think it's also a very localized perspective. Uh, what I'm going to explain myself. I think the North Star Pledge is definitely very uh, culturally speaking adequate for America. You know, like uh, especially um, America and the UK, like Anglo uh, and Anglophone cultures, in which capitalism has definitely like a big form of corp corporativism. And um, so in a certain way, it's a uh, beautiful effort to try to regulate this reality. But I th uh, what, what gives me this uh, as an idea is that I think every culture should, uh, every, every country in a certain way, uh, we, we should create our own organizations, but uh, adapted to our own necessities. You know, like for example, uh, in Latin America, I think it's incredibly important to create more organizations that have, uh, that create decolonizing process in which indigenous people can become closer to the academics and to the medicalization processes on the, same level. on the same level in which they can actually have a word in how you develop psychedelic medicine. I think in Europe, uh, it's very clear that it's going to be something more directed towards how can we make psychedelics part of the State of, of the system. state health system because Europe is more into state health and I think this is exactly the question like we need to adapt psychedelics to each of the realities uh, systemic realities and that means consider considering the systemic elements that conform each of these realities and yeah definitely North Star is uh, pointing towards the fact that in the US corporations are are very menacing and they are they devour processes <laughs> And, and that's why it's very important for it to exist. But I think that in that way, it's also very important for us, us to notice other processes that are happening. You know, like there are amazing organizations in uh, Brazil, in Mexico, in Peru, that are working with indigenous medicine and are, are promoting the advancement of indigenous research. Uh, and I, I think it's very beautiful how many of them are doing it. Some of them have even, you know, like still kind of like the religious connotation. Like there are researchers that are part of Santo Daime or Union do Vegetal or Barquinha who are actually like researching ayahuasca through the religious perspective, but at the same time doing actually uh, research with, with uh, people in jails, with uh, young people with addictions. So I think it's about also 
uh, seeing the elements that we have around us and adapting to them and also in, a, in this way, like as, as we said before, uh, being very aware of the realities of this culture in a very, uh, which includes a lot of the diversity issue. Because in the past year and a half, diversity has become a central issue in the psychedelic community. Like there were these conferences such as Psychedelic Liberty Summit uh, that are starting to talk a lot, a lot about uh, how can we make psychedelics into a more diverse arena? You know, like how can we, can we treat, for example, uh, traumatized refugees with psychedelics? How would we do it? Can we treat, who does it? Uh -huh, who does it? Can we treat women victim of sexual abuse with psychedelics? How can we do it? Because until now, psychedelics have been very white and privileged and only kind of like elitist people have been accessing psychedelics into the therapeutic way or going to Peru to have the ayahuasca ceremony and paying a lot of money. Uh, so I think also the question is how, how can we make psychedelics into something that is more uh, accessible? And the accessibility of psychedelics is something that requires a lot of political and activist uh, level approaches. So that's also one of the reasons why I really respect the work of precisely Chakruna and also of Rick Dublin in MAPS who has been, even if he has been invited many times to become part of the corpor corporation fight, uh, Rick has always been very kind of transparent about that he will not undermine the advancement of corporations, but that he will also support decriminalization and responsible harm reduction use. So, and that's why Sendo Project exists. And I think it's very beautiful to see these kind of like social fighters. And from my point of view, until psychedelics become uh, decriminalized, uh, we should all be social fighters, not only psychedelic therapists, we should all be social fighters. We're talking <laughs> about cognitive liber liberty here, and it's for everyone. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> okay. Yeah, mm -hmm. I love what, everything that you're saying right now. <laughs> so I guess for, for uh, those who do choose to take psychedelics recreationally, how can we create safer environments for those who choose to self-medicate? And um, yeah, what is your advice for that? I think, um, since we're talking about the individual in this way, uh, the individual has to then also take on responsibility uh, in educating and researching whatever he or she will be doing. Um, right now, there's more and more organizations that are providing um, proper information, unbiased um, scientific information, um, experiential information that is out there from um, Sites like Arrowhead, Blue Light, Tripsit, Roll Safe. I mean, there's loads, there's lots out there. So each person has to kind of do their research before doing um, doing substance. Other than that, I think it's also really important that the person who chooses to take anything has a support structure during and after uh, the experience itself. So um, you can take it with people. Then you have kind of a support structure there, even if they're uh, high themselves. Um, if you choose to take anything by yourself, always notify someone as well. Um, they might not have to be sitting next to you throughout the whole trip, but that they're accessible because you never know what can happen. Or if you need to just, you know, express yourself and because uh, expression in itself is, can be, the catharsis can be so important. Uh, and also that you, find people that um, are like-minded in a sense that also know something about or, or, or are part of this culture because uh, it can be really difficult for a person who had this you know mind-blowing experience and then going to their friends or family who do not have any kind of experience and and you know bumping against the wall or disbelief or you know shame of like how could you do this and so we need to have, find for any, any person interested, find there's things on online. There's even something like trip sit where people actually help you actively um, during your trip and you can find communities. Yeah, and I, I, I guess that in a certain way that what this means is that we need to promote harm reduction. Yeah. 
And I think it's interesting because when you navigate around the, the drug world, um, one of the most important bases of the whole drug policy, drug advancement, drug research, one of the most important bases is definitely harm reduction, but I, at the same time, it's one of the uh, most uh, underestimated. You know, like when you talk with uh, psychologists into, that are into psychedelic therapy, and you talk about harm reduction, a lot of them are gonna be like, ah, oh, what's that? And usually like the, the harm reduction movements are usually seen as the, as the punks. Of yeah, the they're, they're as rebels. A, as the rebels or the mm -hmm. punks of the, of the drug world because they are actually real social fighters. And what they are trying to advance is, are these tools so that people can have, uh, have autonomy about their decision of taking drugs. And uh, for example, they promote uh, drug information, drug checking, uh, I think for example, paraphernalia, uh, paraphernalia that like, I think um, a lot of people don't think about that, but you were saying like, yes, if you're gonna take drugs or self-medicate uh, as, as you said, um, you would use, um, yeah, maybe like this kind of like services of people who take care of you and, and whatever. But I think, for example, one of the main things that you should do before anything is to, to check your drug, you know, like to, to make sure that what you're going to take is actually what you think it is. And drug checking services are uh, massively unavailable. Yeah. Uh, and every time that a, a country is kind of like advancing the possibility for drug checking to exist, many uh, government, go governmental uh, authorities, they, they undermine it and they will come and say like, you're promoting drug use. They don't have even a minimum, minimum clue about how harm reduction works and about the fact that usually when you promote harm reduction strategies, people tend to take less drugs and in a less dangerous way than actually taking more. So it's the same as what happens with sex education. You know, like if you give sex education in schools, uh, you won't have the whole school being pregnant. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Like that. People are just not gonna make an orgy. <laughs> are, like, you usually incentivate responsible uh, use. And it, what happens is that many people who are very uninformed about drug policy, but that they are the ones who take decisions about it, they usually tend to think that harm reduction strategies are promoting drug use, when it's the contrary. And, and we have it here in Berlin. I mean, yeah. Berlin, we cannot deny that there's high levels of consumption of substances all around in clubs, etc. Uh, and the government is still, they now said, we can have um, drug checking, but there is still no guidelines or actual, um, uh, they're not actually, we don't know where, when, how. Yeah. We just know that it, it, it can be done, but there's nothing more that has been done about yeah. it. So mm -hmm. it's not happening. Mm -hmm. Wow. Do you guys have any resources that you can share to our listeners that could that they can maybe educate themselves on or just learn about? Well, yeah, of course, there are a lot of beautiful pages uh, with a massive amount of information about uh, how to do drug checking, how to uh, research drugs, like how to understand what, uh, you know, like new research chemicals. Uh, some of them are, for example, arrowweed, uh, which is one, one of the most famous and, and, and yeah, like visited. But you have also like uh, places such as, in my case, like as, as a Mexican, the, 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 these two beautiful organizations, uh, the, um, the Energy Control from Spain and Echele Cabeza from Colombia, they developed a lot of beautiful tools. Uh, me, myself, I was working in Mexico in a project called Reverdecer, which is uh, also giving a lot of resources. And we developed the instrument called the universe of drugs. You can uh, look for the universe of drugs still online now. Uh, I think the webpage was, uh, had a little, little bit of trouble, but uh, you can still look at it in, in Utrice. Uh, and there are, yeah, like other um, pages about uh, drug information in Germany is like um, Alice Project. Alice Project, Sonar. Accent. Also, a lot of these projects have kind of different orientations. So some are more about actual uh, information on the action on the different substances. But then you can have, for instance, uh, students for sensible drug policy, which yeah. is more political, 
or there is Chakruna, which mm -hmm. is more ethno, like anthropological, yeah. there's symposia. Social justice. Yeah. Uh, yeah, and for example, in, 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 in the US, there is Dance Faith, which is mm -hmm. massive. And they work with a lot of different resources. They work with uh, drug checking. They work with drug education. There is also Sendo, which is more about psychedelics specifically. And they have also a lot of resources about how to navigate a psychedelic experience. So I think in a certain way, it's just about making these resources more available and giving them more funding because, oh my God, I've been working uh, in harm reduction for many years. And I can tell you that is the most underfunded uh, organizations in the world. It's, it's amazing how, how, how few money, uh, how little money they have and how much they do with it. And that's kind of beautiful, you know, like to see all these social fighters that are really convinced and that that's the way. And that's, that's why even if I've been working with shamans or with uh, psychedelic therapists, and I still have my heart in the harm reduction scene because for me, those are the real heroes. <laughs> yeah. And also it's open to anyone. So, you know, you are in the end uh, catering to, to the world and not just the few people who decide to do a ceremony or to do whatever. Yeah. Um, yeah, here in, if, if you are in Berlin and you go to a festival, definitely you need to check out uh, Eclipse. And yeah, we, we collaborate with Eclipse and you can come and have a lot of drug information Psych, psych uh, paraphernalia, like there's a lot of also information about how to use this paraphernalia, it's just like, you know, like in inhalation devices so that you don't transmit diseases when you inhale substances, like all of this. Mm -hmm. um, and also if you do wanna um, check your substances, uh, there's a project in Poland called SIN um, and you can, uh, you can actually order the reagents that you need to check online so that you can do it at home yeah which is also you know gives you power to the people yeah 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 scene yeah. project they are they are kind of new but they are doing also amazing stuff <laughs> very, very cool so i think some of our key takeaways are be diverse and very open with the way yeah. that you choose to receive the, the medicine and Test your drugs. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Know what you're taking before you take it. Yeah. And, and really giving more thought and more light and really supporting those organizations who are working on harm reduction and, and, yeah. and doing all these other sort of collaborative efforts. Yeah, decriminalization. Think, yeah, like decriminalization, this, this all of that. Very important and social justice approaches and all this. And also in that way, like uh, re remember that psychedelics are not necessarily need, they don't need to be only included in, in a spectrum of medicalization, you know, like in which, oh, I have depression or I have anxiety, so then I'm gonna take psychedelics, but, but they are very beautiful and complex tools and that there is a lot of information available and you can actually empower yourself or your group of people to use psychedelics in a responsible harm reduction approach way and that you can actually use these resources to use psychedelics to uh, not necessarily treat yourself, but actually like to improve your quality of life through the understanding of yourself mm -hmm. and of the surrounding around you. Mm -hmm. Yes, that's a good closure. Yeah, like, yeah. Nice. yeah. self-exploration is <laughs> always good. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Oh, thank you so much, you guys. I, you touched on everything that I really wanted to to hear and I think as well as our listeners. So thank you once again so much for joining us. Yeah. Thank, you and, for, thank, yeah. thank you for opening this space. Exactly. Thank you for the invite. And I wish you so much uh, luck and yeah, uh, success with what the project that you're creating right now. I'm, it's I'm very mad. important. <laughs> it's very important. Thank you. Thank you so much. And for those who are listening, if you're interested in any other events that are coming up, uh, there will be another event on July 9th on healing with Chinese philosophy. That will be with Dr. Paul Wang. He is a doctor of acupuncture and Chinese medicine. So we're going to be talking about Chinese philosophy, how it relates to cosmology. So some really interesting, juicy stuff there. And then on July 23rd, I'll be interviewing Aviva Bannerman, and she is a ketamine and cannabis-assisted psychotherapist. 
And so she's going to be talking about her work with maps and with Zendo and, and lots of stuff that she does on her one-on-one -on -one sessions. And, and so make sure you check in on that. So we will end there. Thank you so much for everyone joining and see you soon. Bye, <laughs> Bye guys. Bye.